Welcome back. Two days in a row. We're on a roll. Anyway, I got a great, you know, listen, you know, I love talking Yankee baseball. I got Bill Pennington here, a book I'm really looking forward to reading, Chumps the Champs. And, and you know, I, I probably have a feeling I've kind of lived through this process here because uh, I actually spent some time with Brian Cashman last night and I'm just kind of just going through the process and I realized why the Yankees seem to continue to win, but these guys just don't stop. They work so hard behind the scenes, it's nonstop. And uh, I was just getting a little piece of it, but it was, it's just, it doesn't surprise me to see this organization continue to figure ways to win, even with all the injuries, everything we're experiencing right now. Anyway, Trump's the Champs, Bill Pennington, New York Times writer. You know, the book's well written. The Times doesn't hire any chumps. They're all champs over there at the Times. At least that's what Mr. Sandomir tells me. Um, how are you? And why, did, why this book? Well, I mean, I think uh, you may remember those years, but I think there's a fair amount of baseball fans and Yankee fans that maybe don't know just how dark things had gotten in uh, 89, 90, and 91. And, you know, uh, what came to pass afterwards really wasn't predictable at all. It looked like, you know, that's a period when George Steinbrenner was uh, suspended from baseball or on a permanently ineligible list. Uh, the team was uh, had the worst record in baseball in, in 91. I mean, these are... You know, these are things that uh, are not usually a link to the Yankees. And I just, the twist of it all is that as bad as it was, uh, it turns out behind the scenes, including Brian Cashman and others, we're rebuilding this whole franchise. And that's really the, the story I wanted to tell. So sometimes you got to take a few steps back to go a, step, a few steps forward. But you hear that all the time with teams where they're going youth and all this other stuff. But do you believe that that was really their game plan or did they just get lucky? I don't think it was their game plan, but once they were in the situation that they were in, they realized that they had to completely recast everything. I mean, things had obviously broken down. You know, the 80s teams won a lot, didn't get to the playoffs because there was no wild card. Uh, But by the time you get to 90, you know, the track's going, you know, the train's going off the tracks. Uh, They're really kind of the laughing stock of the league, you know, and and that's, you know, that's really rare. So uh, uh, as it happened, I think that, it was an opportunity to say, okay, we have to just start redoing everything. And it happened at a sort of somewhat fortuitous time and that there, it was easy for them to do it at the time. Because they were bad, they were getting number one overall picks and they were getting the six picks so they could pick Jeter. And, um, but they did, uh, in the minor leagues, completely redo everything they were doing um, behind uh, Gene uh, Stick Michael. And Brian Cashman was his assistant. And so they, they did have a plan, but it took years. So if you're first of all, if you're a Yankee fan, you're going to love this book. We should really kind of get behind the scenes about how this all happened. Would you say, because you hear this all the time, that obviously Gene Michael probably doesn't get all the some of the credit he deserves. Was he the, you know, that that kingpin there at that point to make this all happen, or was it just a combination of a few people? Well, it was a common, it was a collaboration, but he's at the head of it. I mean, he's he's definitely the protagonist in this book. I mean, I would say him and Buck Showalter and. George Steinbrenner when he comes back. But uh, do you think maybe the, the absence of George, uh, maybe he had a moment to have a little clarity or a little bit to reset? There's no question that's true. And he, I interviewed Maybe the him best thing ever happened is him getting yeah, it, right? It, yeah, to the team and to him, I think, really. Because, and I talked with him. I mean, I obviously used to interview him. I was a Yankee beat writer in this period. And I talked to him, you know, before he was suspended. During his suspension, I would go to Florida and have lunch with him two or three different times. I talked to him then, and when he came out, I talked to him, and, and he definitely changed. He definitely came He came out a, a different person. And and at the same time, I think the franchise needed a little break from George Steinbrenner's role at that point. And it calmed things down. They In the minors especially, they were able to do what they wanted to do and keep the prospects that they drafted or signed, because, you know, they signed Rivera for $2,000 in 1990. They signed Posada for $30,000 in 1990. They signed Pettit for $80,000 in 1990. It's, uh, it's just amazing, uh, uh, you know, how it all worked out. But, yeah, they needed a little break, and that did give them a chance to retool. And, and same with Stick at the top. Well, what did you learn from this book? I mean, when you think about it, when you put it all together, what was the big message here? Because obviously teams right now are scraping and scrapping to try to figure out this model. Or maybe there's a little more of a modern age model. They talk about the Houston Astros having that model. Uh, what's your take on this? Is is there a formula to recreate and get a baseball team on track and then then to win? Do you believe in that? Yeah, I think there is. And while it has certainly been updated with everything they can do with metrics now and everything, you know, you know, algorithms and all the things that they didn't have in 
uh, in baseball in 90, 91, or 92. But it is interesting that Gene Michael uh, used a lot of what you would call money ball tactics back then. He f- faced them. He was like a Stratomatic baseball player kid. You know, one of those Love kids. Stratomatic. Yeah, me too. I love it. 1-7, baby. <laughs> Boo pow. <laughs> and it was, you know, so he... I talked to him about this, Gene, and, I, and he said, yeah, like I would always pick the guys with high base, on base percentages, you know, and I wanted power numbers and I wanted guys who scored runs. And, you know, so it was interesting that even, you know, growing up in the 50s, he was thinking these things. So uh, when he gets to put them in, in practice, yeah, it, it shapes who he gets. The Paul O'Neills, the Mike Stanleys, you know, the Jimmy Keys, uh, you know, he picks a certain kind of player. Um, and so there is a formula, I think. It, it's, it's, it's always evolving, but there was a formula to what he was doing. Do you think there's one person besides Gene Michael also that helped? And how does Brian Cashman emerge out of all this uh, and do so well and continue to do so well? Is, was that the platform? Was it off this platform, you think? or? Yeah, well, he was Gene. It's funny. He comes in and he, he you know, as all the turmoil of uh, around 1991 when, the, when George is leaving, um, uh, he ascends into Gene Michael's assistant after just a couple of years. And so he's basically learning at Gene Michael's foot and uh, or feet. And, you know, uh, I talked to Brian about this a couple of times, and, and, you know, he just – he just thinks the world of Gene. He, you know, he, le- he learned a lot of that, and he feels like he's still implementing a lot of the same lessons. And the other, there are other people that were big stars in all this. Buck Showalter is certainly one of them. And, you know, he helped create, you know, his big thing was to create a certain clubhouse culture. He wanted to make it uh, a welcoming place so that the ball players would come in, be willing to come in at one or two in the afternoon and spend most of the day there. And he wanted to make their families comfortable there. He wanted to make sure the kids were alive. That was a buck clubhouse. thing. It was, yeah. Really? And I said to Brian, okay, are these things you uh, that you uh, believe in? He goes, believe it. He says, like, we're still implementing them. We, we do those things now. Do you think that there's um – what do you, what do you, besides, obviously, you know the Jeter, you know the first round pick there. What was what was the was there another couple of defining moments that really set this whole thing off? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, <laughs> the development of uh, Rivera is certainly one of them. I mean, you know, they almost trade him a couple of times. Um, uh, there's a scene in the book; it's really kind of uh, interesting from '95 when. Uh, uh, in a day in June in 95, Rivera and Jeter were both sent down. They'd just come up for two weeks. They were up for two weeks with the big club. Right. And Jeter's doing okay. He's hitting like 230 or whatever. But he wasn't really supposed to be the everyday shortstop that year anyway. Tony Fernandez had gotten hurt. So it was okay. But Rivera was really struggling. His velocity had dropped down into like the high 80s. They didn't know what was going on. Gene was you know, going to trade him to Detroit for David Wells. Uh, and... Uh, they, they sent Jeter and Rivera down on a Sunday night, and they both like end up waiting for their flight the next morning out of Newark, and they're just sitting in a Bennigan's in a booth, you know, in a Bennigan's, and they're apologizing to each other because if they both thought if they did better, they, the other one wouldn't have got sent down. And it's funny, you know, I was talking about this, and, I, and you know, you say to them, that you're in this Bennigan's, and they said, yeah, I was full of Yankee fans. It's, you know, did anybody recognize you? Oh, God, no. Nobody had any idea who we were. You know, like we were, we were just two minor leaguers getting sent back to the minor leagues. And, you know, this is mid-'95. I mean, you got to admit, it's, it's a little amazing. bit of luck, though, <laughs> not trading Rivera, the Paul O'Neill thing, not trading Bernie, who was on the back page every other day. We trade Bernie, you know, the center field of that whole aura. I mean, is it luck? Because there's so much talent, and it's so close. The talent between being good, great, and extraordinary is, like, fractional or – well, I mean, obviously, yeah. I mean, there's always some luck in sports, right? I mean, in uh, life, yeah. I mean, yeah. So, yes. I mean, R- Rivera goes down, takes two weeks off because his shoulder was hurting, and then magically starts throwing 95 two weeks later. I mean, I, I I interviewed all these sports medicine scientists and explained the, that whole thing, and they said that's impossible. You can't explain that. And you know, Mariano always says it was you know an act of God. And, yeah, yeah. And Posada's version is well, Jeter used to say that Mariano had Jedi powers. So I mean. What you know? What is all of that? That's not planned. So you're right, and some of those trades could have not worked out, and not everything did work out. You know, they had the number one overall pick, and they took Brian Taylor. Oh boy, who was supposed to be the next disaster? Sandy Koufax, and, and who could they have taken that year? Do you recall? Or no, it's funny. Everybody taking after him didn't really make it. Okay, uh, so you could say he got into whatever. a barroom fight, broke yeah, his hand. Yeah, I mean, he hurt his shoulder. 
Throwing shoulder, shoulder, yeah. Throwing shoulder. Oh, defending God. his brother. Um, oh, God. And it was just not even a barroom fight. It was more just like a shoving match, scuffle type thing, and somebody just kind of pulled on his arm. Uh, you know, it's an, it's it, it takes up a whole chapter. It's just such a tragic. And some of the people that were running the Yankees scouting back then, Bill Livesey and Mitch Lukovic, you know, they consider that like a tragedy to the game because they really felt, felt that Brian Taylor was going to be like a Hall of Famer. He threw like 101 in, you know, and never pitched a day in the major leagues. No, and but in the, you know, before he got hurt in the minors, he he was killing people. I mean, just you know, striking out two guys per inning. Can you imagine? I wonder what he's doing now. I can't imagine. It's a sad story. He he uh, he went back home to North Carolina and he kind of hung around for a while and then eventually got arrested for selling drugs and served like two or three years in prison. And uh, I call I called him and he didn't want to talk. Uh, he but he's living on Brian Taylor Lane in uh, uh, Buford, uh, North Carolina. Wow, that is so sad. Now, did you get into the the winning process? You know, went 90, sure. And what, what do you think the formula was there, and how big a role did uh, Mr. Torrey have in all this? Well, I mean, this book ends pretty much in 96. Uh, uh, so I just sort of, it sort of brings you all the way through where they finally sort of seem to get almost get to the mountaintop in 94, and then the strike that happens. They have this great team that... As Gene Michael said, you know, it's a, probably the best forgotten team in Yankee history because they never got to the postseason. They were in first place. That was the one yeah. year they were going to win the division. They had the best record yeah. in the American League yeah. by far. They were so, rolling along. And, then, you know, as he said, you know, it, it drives him crazy that even, nobody even, I mean, really remembers that team because what are you going to remember them for? They, they didn't that, get who's, the Was that them. Andy Stankiewicz at that point? He was already gone or Roberto no, he Kelly? Was on or? that team. It was, uh, well, it was Jimmy, it was Jimmy Key. Right. I mean, Wade Boggs was there. Mattingly was having a pretty good year. Um, Mike Stanley was a catcher. Right, right. There was, uh, O'Neal was there by then. Uh, Mattingly calls that his favorite team. 94 team. Um, That's a shame. Yeah. Now, was the organization, I mean, I mean, it must have been very disruptive when, when uh, you bring Tory in and, you, and all of a sudden you get rid of... Um, well, Stanley was gone. Um, some of the coaches, obviously. You got different. rid of... Well, I guess that was the whole reason why you make that manager change. He wanted to change the coaches. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the whys of that manager change are really intriguing. It's hard to tell. It almost came down to a war of wills. And, and in fact, as I write in the book, a couple of days after he, uh, he didn't fire uh, uh, Showalter, he just didn't renew his contract, he announces, you know, that Joe Torre is going to become the manager. George flies to Florida and decides to undo it. He wants to bring Showalter back. And he's going to make Joe Torre the president. And he, go, he says this to Showalter in his living room, and Showalter had already agreed to take over the Diamondbacks. But, I mean, imagine how history would have been changed if that had happened. He actually went back to Showalter yes. to try to get him back even after, even after he had hired Tory. Yes, yes. And what did what Tory say about this? Well, Tory wasn't part of the conversation. Oh. He, so <laughs> but he, he has been little... asked about it before. I mean, it, 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 the, the story of that broke. Jack Curry broke that, 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 that this happened about three, four months after it happened, late in nine, 1995. Um, since then, there really haven't been a whole lot of other details about it. It, 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 it. it definitely happened, and we didn't know too, too much. But I finally sat Showalter down when I was doing this book and said, look, you, I, I need to hear the whole story. So I heard the whole story. Do you think that Tory gets the credit in, in part of this turnaround process that he deserves? Well, I, well obviously, everything he did is is. You know, he was pretty uh, magical. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's hard to, you know, just, he doesn't need to apologize for anything. I, I guess you know, a, a better thing that I think about is like, I don't know if the Yankee for office gets the credit they deserve. Like, I get the fact that you want to try to get the best team you can on the field, but I think when you get on a, I don't know, like a fifteen-year run, and you listen, you have to really almost pick it up from '94, really. Right. So you're in '94 right now. You're, you know, you're talking about twenty-five-year run. In all fairness, I don't think a Yankee fan has gone to the ballpark since 94 and felt like, oh, God, this team. I mean, very, very small little. Right. Who has had that kind of run? Oh, nobody. I mean, I think you're right. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing. And, and, you know, even when I was doing this book, you know, one of the questions like to somebody like Willie Randolph, who was Buck Showalter's third base coach and then became Torrey's third base coach. And I said, Okay, so he was giving Buck and Stick a lot of credit for setting the table for what for all the championships that came, 
And I said, well, what about, well, imagine if they didn't get pushed out. I mean, imagine if Showalter stayed as manager. Would it have stayed the same? And he said, you know, I, I'm really not sure. I, I, I don't really think so. He said, because it changed every year. And Joe and Brian Cashman and all these people involved in this enterprise have to, had to adjust every year. It wasn't just like they kept all the same players from 96 to win in 98 and 99 and 2000. There's no question, they had to keep yeah. changing the roster. And so there was a lot to adjust to. So those especially those, especially those, uh, you know, the, the, those five or six players that somehow they managed to bring in and fill certain roles. Right. I feel like they mastered that. Sure. No, I mean, it, it's, and, and especially to do it in this market. I mean, this isn't, a, you know, the easiest place to play. I mean, it's, it, you know, when you win, it's the greatest place. But when you lose, it's not the or greatest a place. What a 25-year run. I know. I and agree. still going. Yeah. I mean, you have a couple of years that are obviously a little wobbly. You can't say every year has been great. But, I mean, geez, I'd sign up for that tomorrow <laughs> again and again and again. And I just think that you hear a lot about back in the 90s about Yankees winning, uh, you know, the management. You know, they, you know, they give out these awards for management of the year awards from just executive management level. And, you know, and what it means to work for the Yankees in the, in the back end of it is extremely highly touted when it's on your resume. But I don't know if people realize how, what it takes, I think, to win. Obviously, putting the best team on the field, you need the right general manager and the right relationship with the other people. But there's all these other things that come into effect. Does that get into your book or not? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think George was such a businessman. Like you know, I mean, he took such pride in the business part of the business. Right. Where sometimes in sports they use the it's just a game, and you know, if we were winning, we'd be better. We'd be ready to run. If we were just winning, things would be better. He never used that as an excuse. He always wanted to run his place tip top, even when they're winning, losing didn't matter. Did you feel that when you talk when you were talking? Yeah, about for sure. And I and I had some good talks with uh, Hal Steinbrenner about about his dad and about some of that you know uh, management style that's been passed down. Uh, you know, it's interesting when in this same period, with everything else that was going on in ninety three, ninety four, ninety five, they're negotiating the uh, the new stadium uh, deal. So that's going on at the same time. And, it, and in, in fact, if the team doesn't revive, I'm not sure they get the same deal. I'm not saying that the stadium wouldn't be where it is. Or maybe they have to move. But that's right. There, and, and during that period, there were, there were you know, possibilities. The city was offering them the Ferry Point uh, spot where, where there's now a golf course. Um, uh, other parts of, of the Bronx. Do so you think the, the new stadium that we see now, that goes all the way back to when? It definitely it goes all the way back to the early 90s, for sure. There was talk of him going to New Jersey. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I was in Steinbrenner's uh, private plane flying from Washington to New York in the late 80s and he, early 90s, and he was, it was one of the, and he was, we were in there and he pointed, we were flying over the Meadowlands, he pointed out the window and he said, that's where I'm going to put my new stadium. Now, he's talking to a reporter that maybe wants to get that message out to New York that New Jersey's in the game. I understand that's all part of the negotiation. Maybe. But. I'm just saying, if the if the team doesn't revive, I'm not sure everything play, plays out. But when the you same. look back at the situation in the Bronx, I don't know if you could blame him. Like we were talking about it the other day, like you go, to, I think like going to the Yankee Stadium right now is probably one of the safest places in America. I mean, I go yeah. there. I mean, yeah. I, I think I want to just hang out there. I mean, it's incredible how safe compared to when I was a kid and young. And you could really understand where George was coming For from sure. as far as just the overall vibe, the feeling outside the stadium, security, parking. The, whole, yeah, like, the roads are different now. They weren't like that. That made yeah. Deegan was a mess to get the Yankee Stadium. You really can't, couldn't blame him for pu- forcing the issue. As it turns out, it ended up working out really well because it's that's where they belong. Well, you got to keep true. it in the Bronx. It definitely, but it, it would have been really weird. It would have been weird yeah. if they were in New Jersey. Yeah, or... or you know, if they weren't in the Bronx, especially, it would have been very weird. But all those things are in there. And did you get a chance to talk to Mel Stottlemyre? I did not. Now, yeah. throughout throughout the years, talk to Mel. Oh or? yeah, sure, of course. Because yeah. I think he's another part that people don't talk a lot about to get a level manager. When you think about Tory, how smart he was. Well, he ran off a third. All right, let's just tuck him over there. But Zimmer and Stottlemyre are really, I mean you know, grade A, quadruple A personality coaches that probably could have managed, actually, if they wanted to. Oh, Zimmer she, did, yeah. Right? She, she got, and as a 50-year guy, Zimmer, she really got, like, three managers. And then, you know, if Willie was here, he would say, you know, I could, I should be, a, should have been a manager all those years, too, and ended up being a manager. But, so, you know, you had a really good, well-schooled guy there, too. I mean, you had probably one of the better coaching staffs that they put yeah, together. It was the, yeah, for sure. There was definitely, and everybody felt it, there was definitely a, a royal, regal type thing going on in that in the franchise in those periods. I mean, the early part of this century. And, you know, it's it continued for a long time. You can make a case it's still continuing. 
But do you think, like, when you get to the uh, Chumps part of it all, do you think, like, playing in the old stadium, was it, did they talk about that as being a distinct advantage, or did they felt like that? Because there was a lot of, you know, a lot of downsides to that stadium <laughs> as far as, you know, the way just the way it played, yeah. the rain, the lack of the drainage, right. the clubhouse, the dugouts. Like, you know, it's not, not an easy place to play. No, it was an old, it was an old building. And uh, it's funny. It's not funny, but it's interesting that right in this period when the team is at its worst, 90-91, a beam falls out of the, one morning, a beam falls out of the upper deck into the mezzanine. Of the old Yankees. That was over by uh, on the third base yes. side, right? Remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. yeah. That Good was, memory. That was crazy. Yeah. Oh man! But I mean, the, so when I when I write about how the empire was 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 crumbling, I mean, it literally was crumbling on multiple fronts. The stadium was literally falling apart. TV ratings at that point were going down. Uh, attendance was going down. It was down quite a bit, almost thirty percent in ninety ninety one. I, it was like 19,000 a game or something oh, crazy. Yeah, right? I, there's, there's a picture in the book, of the first game of a doubleheader, Twine Night doubleheader, and it, there can't be more than a couple hundred people there. I love going to the stadium back then. You know, I get, I go, I, I just zip over to the game and, you know, just get on the six and boom, pick up a ticket for five bucks and boom, yeah. I was sitting golden. I know. It's hard. I think it's hard for the Yankee fans to understand sometimes what it was like in those, in those days uh, and because how different you know, and better they have it now. I mean, I have a 20-year-old son. He, he does no grasp of what I'm talking about, really. His How whole could life, he? the Yankees have just yeah. been great, you know. Yeah, what a beautiful stadium. These right. guys, it's right. just amazing. But <laughs> I, I think it was amazing, the old stadium, too. But It had a different vibe. It's true. It, it, it had a, it, you know, you did feel like the ghosts of, of Ruth and Gehrig there. I feel it's so hard to even explain, even like, you know, going back to what Thurman Munson meant, the 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 how big Don Mattingly was in this town, not to mention, you know, going back, I mean, 77, 78, maybe you kind of feel that, but you, when you go back to the Yogi's, Whitey Fords, I mean, can you believe the history of this franchise? It seems like they've just been blessed because it just seems, no other franchise kind of has this continuity of stars and just great moments, great things happening. Does anybody, does anybody get their arms around why all these great moments and great things happen at the stadium? Well, I don't know if we, we talked too much about that in this book because it, uh, you know, they only had a, it, it has a finite period. But I think there's a lot of talk about how different and distinct it is for playing for the Yankees than playing anywhere else. I mean, Jimmy Key, for example, had a pretty decorated career before he became to, came to the Yankees. But Toronto. He still talks about playing for the Yankees as if that was, a, you know, the highlight of his career. Hall of Famer Jimmy Key. Is he? Borderline. Borderline. Tough, yeah. He won with Toronto, though. Sure. So, but didn't get the win. He got the one win on 96 with the Yankees. Right. But probably doesn't really get recognized as being a guy who's won multiple championships. That's true. But, yeah, that's a tough one. You know, pitchers are often tough when it comes to Hall of Fame voting. It's, uh, it's, this is just CC Hall of Famer? Jeez. That's another close one, too. With 3,000 strikeouts, it makes you wonder. Makes and dominant happen. at that period. You know, it's yeah. a bummer is that he goes pitches his heart out for Cleveland and then Milwaukee. He really doesn't come away with as much as he should on the hardware end right. of it, but was dominant. Took both those teams over the hump himself. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, if they if he were if they if this team this year were happened to win the World Series and he pitched in it, that would help a lot. Yeah, that would help a lot. I'd like to see him get ten more wins. Would help a lot too. Well, that would just to climb out of that Kurt Schilling yeah, cloud exactly. and just get in his own. It's funny, you know, that, that, that how the numbers, you know, that yeah. supposedly some of those numbers don't matter anymore like they used to. But when it comes to the Hall of Fame, it seems like they do. The question is his personality and character. That's true too. And authenticity about your your commitment to the game and mm -hmm. how you act. Does that count? Because I think that you know Mo, you know Mo getting the unanimous says how you act and how you treat this game and the kind of person you are counts yeah because otherwise you can make an argument that somebody would not uh, vote again for him for whatever reason but the unanimous says you know we we appreciate what you meant to the game not just the numbers correct so the and question did, about it. does jeter go unanimous Jeez, i would hope so you would think probably uh, but knowing how it works in other parts of the country and he's got some haters. He's got some media Absolutely. people that are definitely Absolutely. not in love with him. Absolutely. So that could come back and I, I haunt him. That he, he won't. I don't but think if, he's up I, and I worrying about this, by the way. No, but yeah, yeah, that's for sure. He's got, <laughs> plus, he's got a few other worries right now. Yes, he does. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think he should, frankly, because, I mean, I mean, on the face of it, I mean, does anybody really think he's not going to get in? So what's the point of making him wait? 
I mean, that's what I, that's how I would. Well, think. I don't know about waiting, but it's unanimous. Like, I'm sure he's getting in, well, but, but. Every vote comes down to whether you think he belongs. So you're saying he doesn't belong? I'm, oh, no, I'm saying <laughs> he should be unanimous. I'm saying right. there's some knucklehead out there, like many other players, well, where he's yeah. not going to get a yeah. unanimous. Right. I don't mean you. Yeah. I mean, okay, you're, yeah. this, you're the guy in Atlanta who's not voting for him. What is your reasoning? Other than you just don't want him to be unanimous. Well, what kind of reasoning is that? You know, you, you know. I, we go over so exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but you, can you see that happening now? Yeah. I definitely see it. I, see that, definitely. I, I know a lot of writers. I mean, I know, I know what. But you don't have a vote. Like. I have a vote. I, uh, the New York Times doesn't allow us to vote. They don't want us to be part of the story. Let's say I was the guy who didn't make it unanimous. Then I'm part of the story, and they don't want us to. It's all the times. It's time for change and get the Bob <laughs> Dylan song out. You know what I mean? Come on. I mean, yeah. give, give on. Yeah, if you got the vote, what, what do you have? But at this day and age, isn't it all about that? Well, it's also true that uh, I don't know about it anymore, but in the past, and I, I would, I haven't done this, but in the past, the, the vote is uh, anonymous, so you could have voted. And That's true. I know, I know, Times colleagues that but have these, voted, but these anyway. days now, you know, it's amazing people. They come oh, out and say, I, I say, was yeah, the one. No. I, I, yeah. I voted oh, you yeah. down. And it's oh, not, nothing is anonymous in the Well, why have you? Do you put Pete Rose in? No, I don't. So you're, you're an anti-Pete? Yeah. So you're not so, putting any steroid or, or, or uh, performance? No, I, I wouldn't put any st people that had steroid. Was Pete, was a little different. Pete to me was, you know, the being the manager in gambling, I, I can't get past that. Okay, fair. Uh, do you get past the performance enhancement stuff or? Um, some. Like I, you know, I mean, it's hard. It's a hard, it's a hard choice for me. First of all, I haven't had to face this that much. I just get asked the question. I don't. Yeah, I haven't voted. I can't get my arms around it because I just think it. I think everyone was cheating on some level. That's why I look at it until yeah. somebody can convince me that they weren't. But then, does that mean that if you get somebody who clearly, you know, was a uh, a good but not great ball player who suddenly for five years was unbelievable? Are you going to put him in, even though you know that those five years were, t you know, were based on PEDs? I mean, doesn't that matter at all? I mean, I'm not talking about Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens. I'm talking about, you know, some other player who wasn't a Hall of Fame. And we're dealing with a few of those players that we're dealing. More well, I guess the few. question is, is it wrong only until is it only actually really wrong only if you get caught? Because we always talked about it as kids, like, right. listen, I took that candy bar from the candy store, but I didn't get caught, and you did. Right. So is what I did just as wrong as what you did? Of course it is, but I didn't get caught. Right. And then we know that there's a lot of players out there that didn't get caught, and they are borderline, and a couple of them are maybe going to sneak into the Hall of Fame possibly. I just think I would side on the – I personally would – I understand the argument. I personally would side on the, the, the uh, that if I know or I'm pretty certain that you were that you were doing that, and I'm, it, that man, that matters to me. So what that's going to affect my debacle. vote. What a debacle. That's why the did, whole did, thing did is a debacle. Well, no, the whole thing's a debacle now because there's so many different ways to take these things and, yeah. and climb underneath the testing so you can take it but not get caught, even though you're taking it because you come underneath those numbers. Yep. Yep. And I think there's a lot, a lot of that going on. And I just think the game is flawed in this regard that it's asking the players to do too much. And then you want to know why they do what they do. Like, chicks dig the long ball. That's what we're paying for. But don't take anything that's going to help you hit the long ball. Duh. And then play 162 games, you know, get to the ballpark, work 10 hours in the heat and everything else, and no time to recover. Just get right on that plane and don't expect players to need something to get them back so they can stay on the field even, let alone some of them are just taking the stuff to get a little more jacked up to jack the ball right. out. I think that formula is that we're all, like, asking these guys to do stuff, but then we don't want to deal with the how they have to go do it. And it's a little irresponsible on the fan standpoint. Like we're all there. Oh, it's no home runs. It was a boring game. Right. And then we're gonna go. Then the next day we're gonna bitch about. Oh, we these guys are taking this stuff. Like right. I mean, it's a very slippery slope, though, because it, I mean, let's just look at it in, in like an Olympic sport like track and field. Okay, I think you go to watch the hundred meters or the mile because you want to see human achievement at, a, at at its highest level. Now. Let's say we didn't have any rules. Let's say there were no doping rules at all. They could just do whatever they want, which in some ways they are. But, Thank you. But, but let's just say there were no rules at all. And like you, you know, so you go, and the guy, it's 10 years, 20 years from now with no rules, and you go and you watch the 100, and the guy wins in seven seconds. I mean, are you, are you impressed? Do you really, wouldn't you ruin the sport potentially? I mean, do I really want to watch a guy who's just 
you know, using drugs to run the hundred and seven. Come on, seconds. do you not think we were sitting there watching the Tour de France we, we, and, and not knowing? I mean, I don't not watch the Tour de France, but not knowing in the back <laughs> of our mind that that this was all going on. Yeah, I understand. I mean, the I, whole freaking. I, I mean, the well, whole. I mean, it's that's freaking, why we're all selectively ignorant. I mean, it's it's delusional. What's going on? I mean, I, you don't think any of these football players? No, I cover football. I know. I see the, the weight gain and the weight loss when they retire. They're taking it in high school. Yeah, I understand. And that's sad. Because I know. It's 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 a tough one. It's it just is really, tough. It's you really, go on and on about it. Right. It's crazy. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I wish I had the answer because I think the first thing should be just safety and consistency would be second. Which is either agree to do this, agree to do that, but most importantly, don't risk your life, man, and don't compromise your life for you know a couple of home runs or you know be able to run for a few more touchdowns. That's what that's what kind of scares me. But listen, you heard about this, you know, the, the, they did a poll and they went to this Olympic athletes and said, look, if you take this pill, we guarantee you're going to gold medal, but you're going to die by the age of thirty. And like a high percentage said, I'll take that pill. I want to win that gold, and that's sad. But I asked my son this question. I said, listen, if I give you this pill right now, I guarantee you right now, take this pill, you'll be a multimillionaire, you'll be successful, never never have to work another day the rest of your life. Or you can take this other pill, but you're going to have to work your tail off for the next 20 years, and then you'll be successful and it's guaranteed. My son's like, I had to take that bird in the hand. I got to take that money now, Dad. I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm like, seriously? (laughs) Even if it could jeopardize, you know, even if it jeopardizes potentially how long you're going to live, he goes, I don't know about that. Maybe I get me thinking a little differently, but... If you tell me I could take the pill now and 100% be guaranteed the money, I'm taking it. And I think that's sad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, what are you going to do? I mean, it's cry. It, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's cry, man. It's, but I uh, love the book, Chumps the Champs. Now, I assume it's an Amazon. Oh, sure. Now, Facebook page, where people want to ask you questions and stuff like that, are you, are you kind of interacting with people about this book? Or? Yeah, some. I mean, you know, I'm not highly active in, fa- in Facebook, but yeah. In this New period, York Times. Probably. I feel like the New York Times is a little snobby, like. You can't get to the writers as well as some of the other writers. Like you're not tweeting and all that stuff. I, I'm, they email me all the time. I answer. I answer plenty of emails. Okay, so you're an email guy. Yeah. Now, are you doing any kind of Q and A's or anything out there? That we or any bookstore signings or anything like that? It was a bookstore signing in a sat, a Saturday in Ridgewood, New Jersey. Bookends. You may want to promote that. Well, that, that's I, a big. I, that's a biggie, uh, right? I was. I that's was here like to answer whatever questions you have. For yeah, me. but selfless promotion is very stuff. important. I my, 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 my platform knows that we shamelessly promote. Well, we 1 o'clock, I will be there, yes. At Ridgewood. At Ridgewood. That's a biggie store, right? That's kind of a big, that's a big it's one. It's a big, yeah. they, they really turn out, uh, uh, they have great events. When you go there, you know, people show up and ask questions and are really into it, buy the book, want to talk to you. Do Old signings. school in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, I miss that. Big, pretty big crowds. I mean, he does a really good job. He he really does. I miss that. Now you did the audio on this book too, or yeah, I, I didn't do it, but they, we paid for a guy with a yeah. more professional voice than me. Same, yeah. I, I I think the ADHD killed me on my books, where I just couldn't sit there for ten hours and read it, <laughs> which is pathetic. I should I have done my that, voice. Yeah, I listened to the guy's voice who actually did it. And I said, man, that's that sounds cool. I want him to do it. The funny thing on my balls book, the guy called me up and he asked me some questions. Then he called me up like a month later. He goes, I'm just finishing this up, but I just got to say I would have loved to have met your mother. That was the you got to have balls. He goes, I love this book. I was like, that's really nice. But I'm sure the guy who's read yeah, a zillion books. That is nice. And it's nice that the guy, and he kind of had a similar voice to mine, so it was kind of cool. Yeah. Got away with that. People that's think good. that's actually my voice, but it's not. It's not on the balls. But. <laughs> Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, come to Ridgewood. What's the name of, that? What's the name of the bookstore? Bookends. Bookends. That's, that's yeah. a biggie. It's on Main Street or Ridgewood Avenue right now. We'll post it. What's we got that? a couple questions, oh, too. You know something? We got a couple minutes more? Sure, we'll do a few Q&A if you're sure. bored and you're in your office doing nothing. You should be doing some work, by the way. But this is more interesting. Yeah. Couple of questions. Let's go for Bill. Uh, from yeah. Alejandro, Bill, which move do you think started turning the Yankees around or made looking for a better future? Uh, uh, boy, if I had to pick one, I would say the hiring of Gene Michael as general manager, um, which maybe doesn't happen if uh, uh, George Steinmeier isn't doesn't happen to be suspended at that time, and he had to turn to somebody he trusted that, and, and he knew Stick since he was a ball player. So that's probably the key uh, move. A question from Monty. How much did Don Mattingly's back injury contribute to the poor team records from 89 to 91? Yeah, significantly. Uh, I was there in Milwaukee when he first hurt his back, when it first he scratched from the lineup and he suddenly had a uh, back injury. And that was in his prime. He was, you know, he was the best player in the American League, hands down. Maybe even in baseball. Yeah. But, but do you think maybe, because he was such a hard worker, 
think maybe he just overdid it? Oh, absolutely. He Too much, about right? that years later that, you know, and I remember he would hit, he would take early BP. Him and Mike Pallirulo would be on the field at like 1 o'clock. In fact, they would ask sports writers to go out there and shag. They'd ask anybody to go out and shag because they couldn't get it. I remember me and uh, Tom Verducci and I would be out in the outfield shagging balls. Love because that. on the road, we didn't, and yeah. at home he could get people to do it, but on the road he needed help. And but yeah, he would hit and hit and hit, and then he, after he'd leave the field, he'd go hit in the cage for another like ninety minutes or something. So later, he he admitted that he thinks he probably just wore it out. I got to ask way, him about you know? that. He was such a hard worker. I don't know if people oh, realize. Sure. I mean, he's so great fielder, hitter. I mean, the whole package. God, we feel like we got cheated a little there. For sure, right? Yeah, no. Uh, Scott asks, do you think the Yankees can be now what they were in the nineties? It's interesting. I, I think there are parallels to what they're doing now with the uh, the homegrown talent to what they did in the early ni- early mid nineties. I mean, you know, if you look at Sanchez and Judge and Andujar and you know, I mean, there's a bunch of there's definitely a, uh, there's definitely a parallel. Uh, you know, they add some other stars, but I think Cashman is kind of following that model that he witnessed in the in the early nineties in a lot of ways. And final question here from Pete. These new guys, the replacements, are doing great, he says. You think it will st- affect the Stars' confidence, Judge, Stanton, Hicks, DD, when they return? Boy, guys who are that good and uh, that accomplished in the major leagues usually aren't lose confidence. Yeah, that I don't see that at all. <laughs> I think it's a boost. You know, when you have guys behind you, you can get the day off. But I think those guys are It's really clear that they're the future. And if you got the... Other guys coming up, you fill in. If not, you got them as trade bait to get even some something you obviously need. Yeah, I mean, I think if you've been in, you know, MVP like Stanton and, a, you know, finished second the rookie of the year like Judge, and I, I don't think your confidence would be shaken too much. Yeah. I think the nervousness is just, you know, not getting hurt again because yeah. you've now gotten hurt two years in a row. And I think that kind of bothers guys. Get, they get something the guys' skin a little bit when you start getting hurt. A couple different times in a couple different years, you start missing significant time. You're more afraid of getting hurt again. Correct. Because health you, is the yeah, one thing they yeah. can't control. I mean, that's the gift that all those ball players wish that you know for each other or wish for themselves. Because it's the one thing they can't really control. They can control their contract. They can even control, you know, playing time. They can they can complain to somebody about where they want to hit in the lineup. There's a million things they can do or their agent can do for them, but they can't make them healthy. What's amazing is, and a closing note is, it's just amazing how how at, you captured the beginning of the Yankee run and how long this run is, which is bigger, greater, and better than any other team in sports history. Mm-hmm. I don't know anybody's had the kind of run, and then they're about to get on another one on some level. They're right in the middle of it, really. If you look at the last two years, you can't. It's pretty good. Mm-hmm. For I mean, sure. uh, that's, it really is. I mean, I think you probably got to study the Yankees as a business, even, you know, just to just imagine you know, that's what we're all trying to do in business. Yeah, I'm, right? I'm sure. I mean, I would, I'm sure there are a million theses written in college every year about the Yankee model. Yeah, I think it's, think it's been a blessing for me to be involved. I mean, I'll to bet. be partners with them just to see both sides of it, you know, dealing a lot with the players and dealing with the front office. And the learning lessons for me have just been just one after the other. It's been amazing. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming on board. It's Bill Pennington Thanks here. Thanks for having me. Good book. Pick it up. If you're a Yankee fan, you got to have this good Father's Day gift, good graduation gift to kind of get your kid up to snuff of what really went down here so you don't take the Yankees winning for granted. You understand how this all developed and evolved. And uh, if not, pick them up. New Jersey, Ridgewood, 1 o'clock Saturday. He'll be signing. Have a great day, everybody.